Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's event, The Story of Cantonese at Stanford. Uh, big shout out and thank you to SAPAC for sponsoring this event. Uh, Kevin, would you like to say a little bit more about your organization? Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Su. I'm a former president of SAPAC, the Stanford Asian Pacific American Alumni Club. We're really, really pleased and glad to be able to host this event today. Um, we have some really great alumni speakers who are going to be talking about a very vital question that is in front of us uh, right now. Uh, if you're interested in joining SAPAC, it is open to all Stanford alumni and also to um, current students because once you've been at Stanford for three quarters, you qualify as an alumnus. Uh, <laughs> and you can sign up at sapac.org, S-A-P-A-A-C.org. Uh, we work in areas ranging from advocacy and education to hosting local events, both physically in wherever chapter you are or online as well. And uh, it's for, it's called Asian Pacific American Alumni Club. But even if you're based in Asia, if you're, um, if you think of yourself as Asian, um, it's open to Asians and Asian Americans and Pacific Islander alumni. So uh, we're really glad to be um, a family and also a voice for the API community uh, at Stanford and raising, raising the spotlight, um, raising our voices to kind of let the university know about the issues we're interested in and kind of building this community is our mission. And so that's why we're very glad to host the event with you today. And um, many, many thanks also to um, Emily, who was able to help us pull together this event, as well as to Lon, um, who also helped organize. Awesome. We are so excited to have this public event. Um, and it's not just Stanford folks who are in the room. As you can see from the chat, there are people from all over who are joining us today. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, and then we'll do a couple of polls just to uh, see who all is in the room. Uh, but just to get us started, uh, Dr. Gina Ann Tam received her PhD in Chinese history from Stanford in 2016 and is an alum of the Stanford Cantonese program. She's currently an assistant professor at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Her first book, Dialect and Nationalism in China from 1860 to 1960 traces the significance of local languages in China, including Cantonese, to the making of Chinese national identity. Thank you for joining us, Gina. Uh, Dr. Sik Lee Denig, or who, I, I, who, we, who we know as Zheng Lusi, is a native of Hong Kong. Uh, she received her PhD in educational linguistics at Stanford in 92. And she has taught language and linguistic courses to students of different ages in Hong Kong, Japan, Canada, and the United States. At Stanford, she has taught Cantonese for over 20 years and done research on how heritage speakers maintain and develop Cantonese. Her teaching and research have highlighted the role of sociopolitical context and the interconnectedness between language and identity in heritage language learning. Thank you for joining us, Zheng Losi. Um, finally, Hello everyone, my name is Jamie Tam. I'm an alum of Stanford's Cantonese program from the class of 2010, and also one of the leaders behind the campaign to, stay, to save Cantonese at Stanford. I'm also the co-founder of an organization or a social media-based campaign called Black Lives Matter Cantonese, a language education initiative that aims to equip members of the Cantonese diaspora with language skills for conversations around racial justice. I'm currently an assistant professor of health policy at the Yale School of Public Health. So, Super excited to get us started. And I think um, since we're not all able to see you and we have 118 attendees right now, we have a couple of polls. Uh, and if you would like to just sort of chime in and let us know where you're joining us from. So we have a sense of who all is in the room. Another question, where did you grow up? All right, interesting. So we've got a majority of folks are joining us from the US. Um, some 30% so far grew up in Hong Kong. Um, some like some 52% grew up in the United States, around 7% grew up in Canada. Uh, and we have, I know it's early for those of you who are in Asia right now. So I don't blame you if you know you're struggling um, at this hour, but most folks are, um, I'm gonna, do you mind if I share this, these results? Okay, here we go. Um, most folks are joining from the West Coast. We've got a handful of folks joining from Hong Kong and China, Asia, um, and yeah, great. Thank you very much. 
All right. Awesome. New Zealand, amazing. Um, so I think what we're gonna do now is actually give uh, Dr. Gina and Tam, we're not related by the, by the way, we just have the same last name, uh, get Dr., give Dr. Tam uh, a chance to, uh, to share a little bit about uh, the history of Cantonese. So Dr. Tam, would you like to take it away? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Tam, <laughs> for that really nice introduction. Um, and I'm, I'm so delighted to be here and I'm so honored to be here um, and, and to be sort of talking to the, to the Stanford community again. So first, I want to just thank um, SAPAAC for, or SAPAC um, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, and, and so I, I just want to briefly sort of mention my expertise here. So um, I graduated from uh, Stanford with my doctorate in 2016. Uh, my field is modern Chinese history, uh, but my field of research is I'm really interested in the in the intersection between uh, language and 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 sort of Chinese national identity in China, um, and looking at that history, um, and what my book does is it, it tries to look at that question and that relationship um, by looking at languages that aren't Mandarin, um, which are which tends to be the focus when we focus on the relationship between language and national identity. We tend to focus on national languages, um, and China is no exception. And and to me, I wanted to sort of explore that from all of these languages that went from sort of being these really prominent parts of local communities, and they still are, but to being framed as, as, as something else, something sort of juxtaposed against the national language. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Um, I took Cantonese with Zheng Xi for a year, um, which was, was really integral to my writing of this book. Um, I, I think that it's, it made it possible for me to read materials and to really sort of understand um, this history in a way that I don't think I could have otherwise. Um, so I'm really fortunate to be a part of this program. Okay. So let me go ahead and, and jump in. And I realize I should start time myself, which I should have been doing earlier. Um, so um, I want to just start us off by talking a little bit about what Cantonese is, right? Um, because Cantonese is a bit of an ambiguous term. Uh, generally speaking, when we talk about Cantonese, we are primarily talking about the language that's spoken in Hong Kong and, and Guangzhou, um, which have some sort of differences. But generally speaking, that's, that's what we mean when we say Cantonese. Um, but it can also sort of the term Cantonese in English can sometimes extend out to include a bunch of neighboring languages and dialects throughout this region of South China. So this area sort of down, um, down here, right? Um, and what or what linguists would call the Yue language family. Um, so for simplicity's sake, we're gonna we're gonna stick with the definition um, that's that's more common, largely because we're here to talk about Cantonese at Stanford and the Cantonese like pedagogy and the Cantonese that we would often learn in any class would be similar to the kinds of like pronunciation and 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 syntax that's used in in Hong Kong and Guangzhou. But I think it's worth emphasizing here that when we're talking about Cantonese and Chinese languages in general, our terms have often multi valent, um, or they're often multivalent, they're often ambiguous, sometimes linguists will use terms in a particular way that everyday people will not, um, and vice versa. Um, and so I just want to sort of highlight the ambiguity there. So as sort of a southern Chinese language, the bulk of Cantonese speakers live in these southern areas down here of China. But because of the history of the Chinese diaspora, Cantonese is spoken all over the world. Um, people from the area that, that the country today we call China began moving overseas in the last few centuries, many of whom were from southern provinces of China. So as a result, while the Chinese diaspora is incredibly linguistically diverse, Cantonese is one of the largest spoken languages um, among overseas Chinese communities. Um, it's spoken by large communities in Malaysia. 15% uh, of Chinese in Singapore speak Cantonese. Um, and the, and, it, and actually in sort of your, not my, because I'm, I'm in Texas, but in your own backyard, um, it is the most widely spoken Sinitic language in the Bay Area. I bring this up because I think it's really important when we talk about the significance of Cantonese to the world to recognize that it is not only a language that is authentically central to communities in South China and Hong Kong and Macau, um, but the, this language is also authentically central to communities around the globe and a core part of the global history of transnational migration. So as we can see, Cantonese is a really widely spoken language um, with upwards of 80 million native speakers. Um, so why does this language so often not have the kind of teaching infrastructure and support that we have for so many other languages that often have fewer native speakers? Um, and this isn't just at Stanford, this is around the world and even in China itself. 
right? Um, I'd argue that one of those reasons is because Cantonese is often not thought of as a language. It's often thought of as a dialect. Um, and I, I think it's worth talking a little bit about first, why it's called a dialect and second, why I think that's a problematic term to use. Um, so let's start with the nitty gritty of linguistics. Um, I can answer more questions on this sort of in, 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 in Q and A if, you're, if anybody is interested, um, but I'll try and keep it simple here. Um, so sometimes, uh, like people who want to claim that Cantonese is, is a dialect will defend it on linguistic terms, but these definite these explanations often fall apart when we examine them. So one of the primary tests for calling something a dialect is mutual intelligibility um, with another language. And Cantonese is not mutually intelligible with Mandarin, certainly, um, but other Sinitic languages as well. Um, it does use this sort of like is tethered to the same script as other Sinitic languages, but script rarely has a bearing on whether or not we consider something a dialect um, or a language. I mean, English and Spanish use the same script, right? Um, so furthermore, Cantonese has a pretty significant grammatical and phonetic differences um, from other Chinese languages. So when you sort of look at why we would call something a dialect, these arguments don't really make a lot of like sense, right? So what we're left with um, is a foundation for calling Cantonese a dialect that's not about sort of linguistics, um, but about collective identity and politics. Um, historically, we have often thought that like it was just sort of the, the sort of general discourse about language is that they are inextricably linked to both ethnicity and nation. Um, and this sort of fact about um, how we're conceiving of the modern world and what languages are in the modern world um, compelled really powerful people within China in the last 130 years or so to promote the idea of a singular Chinese language spoken by the Chinese people and representative of the Chinese nation and ethnicity, right? These are often conflated in these, in these, in these conversations. Um, and while sort of one of the most powerful groups here that, that pushes this line is the government, the current government of the People's Republic of China. Um, it is certainly not limited um, to the, to, to, to um, you know, government discourse, elites, academics, everyday people um, all around the world. This is something I see everywhere I go. Um, and even other governments, there was a real push in um, Singapore to make this claim, right, that, that Mandarin is, is the primary Chinese language. Um, and, and I do want to be clear that when I say that this this argument about language and dialect is really much more about um, about about sort of ethnicity and and nationality and politics, um, that it's not just sort of me making this up. It's really not difficult to find discourse um, among officials and academics or everyday people making the claim that languages are spoken by ethnicities and because or nations and because Cantonese is not ethnicity and Hong Kong or Guangzhou are not independent nations, Cantonese can't be thought of as a language. So why am I talking about this at all, right? Um, well, I, the reason I want to sort of spend a fair amount of my time with you today, which I'm looking at how much time I've spent, <laughs> um, is because I think that when we call, what we call Cantonese isn't neutral. Um, I think that it necessarily connotes linguistic hierarchies, languages and like the terms languages and dialects. So when we call Cantonese a dialect, we are confirming this notion that there is a Chinese language um, and other Chinese languages are necessarily sort of subsidiary and therefore less important. Um, moreover, when we presume that there is a Chinese language, we also imply that it can represent all Chinese identities um, and that there, is, that there is a language out there that can represent Chineseness in total. Right? And, and what that discourse does is it negates the fact that Chinese communities are diverse and multivalent, um, instead presuming that certain expressions of Chinese identity can and should be hegemonic. So in sum, um, it, the reason, uh, what I really wanna sort of emphasize here is that we need to face head on the political nature of categories like languages and dialects and highlight the broader sociocultural hierarchies we, and by we, I mean everyday people or like institutions like Stanford, what we subtly reinforce when we say Mandarin is a language that deserves institutional support and Cantonese is a dialect that does not. When Cantonese is the spoken language of so many people and so many diverse communities that are worth including and understanding and engaging with, it matters when we presume their languages are variants, right, or, or subsidiary. Um, as Chicana cultural studies scholar Gloria Anzaldúa reminds us in her book, La Frontera, Borderlands, my language is my skin, right? And if the goal of learning another language is to open a window into other cultures and ways of looking at the world, this is a diverse community we are leaving out when it's difficult or impossible to learn their language. 
Um, so I will go ahead and stop there within time um, and hand it over to, I believe, uh, Jen Losi is going to speak next. Actually, we have a little poll before okay. we dive into um, Jen Losi's uh, presentation. So oh, first, what was your language environment like growing up? And do you consider yourself a native speaker, heritage speaker, student, supporter, but not a speaker? Um, I'm just gonna give folks one minute to respond. Uh, while we're giving folks a chance to respond, we do have one question for you, uh, Dr. Tam. Does the fact that, this is from my sister, <laughs> Jody. does the fact that many people identify themselves as Cantonese people make it more of a language than a dialect? Is this more of a social acceptance? That's a great question, um, and and um, and I see another question that within the first few words, I already, I'm already like very much used to hearing this question. Um, it's probably the most quest the the other question is the one I get asked the most about my book. Um, so um, I'll start with uh, Jody Tam's question. Um, that's a that's a question that I have a really hard time answering, right? Because it's. Um, so I'll start with sort of why that often is seen as, as controversial, right? And that is because um, in particular, sort of what I know best as the government of the, the PRC, because that's my field, right, is really invested, I think, in promoting this idea of, of, of ethnic unity and national unity and homogeneity. And so the idea that there is a sort of Cantonese people um, is, 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 I think, sort of in some ways, very threatening to that framework. Um, I'll give one example very briefly is um, in Hong Kong a few years ago, uh, there was this like educational packet that sent around to secondary schools in Hong Kong that basically said Cantonese can't be called a mother tongue. Um, and their argument was that because according to the UN definition of mother tongue, um, mother tongues are spoken by ethnicities and Cantonese is not an ethnicity. And like this caused a huge uproar in, in Hong Kong. There were all these YouTube videos mocking this, right? Like protests with people saying mothers speak Cantonese and therefore it can be a mother tongue. Um, and so to sort of answer your question, I think that one of the things that's really unique and sometimes defies, um, I guess you could say comparison globally about Chinese is that um, it is not common to have people who, who identify as the same sort of ethnic and national identity um, speak very different languages, right? Um, in, in the sense, and like thinking of them as part of that ethnicity or or, um, or, or ethnic identity, right? To think of these as Chinese languages when there's a nation called China, right? Um, and so I, I don't know if that makes it more or less socially acceptable, but my guess is that that is something that, that would be threatening to people who are really invested in this idea of, of one Chinese identity. Um, and that I'd also say that sort of as far as, as my um, sort of, um, investment goes in this debate, to me, what I would really like to see is, is honesty and transparency about the political nature of this, of these categories, um, because then we can sort of face head on who we erase um, and who we, and who um, we sort of, whose languages we allow to be less important um, if we are very honest about the fact that they're, they're political, right? Um, so that's that first question. Um, yep. If we, we if we could hold off the rest yes, of the question, <laughs> we have a lot of questions coming in, and we're really excited about your engagement. But we do want to give you all a chance to hear from uh, Joan Losi, Dr. Sickly Denig. As you can see, we do have uh, most of the folks in this space have Cantonese spoken at home, or are native speakers, or are heritage speakers. But we also have a good number oh. of folks who speak other Sinitic languages, um, and, a, and, a, and a handful of folks who are not speakers, but supporters of us. So um, thank you for, uh, for voting and um, or sharing in, your, in the poll. And I think we're going to hand it over to you, Joan Losi. Oh, OK. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me see. I'll share my screen. And so um, I just want to ask something about my background. So I was, I grew up in Hong Kong, huh? So I actually, but I was very fortunate. I actually um, grew up in an environment in which um, many different languages were spoken because my parents actually moved to Hong Kong uh, from Eastern China. So I was exposed to Shanghainese and all these other varieties, you know, that were spoken, um, in Eastern China. So I also, you know, was exposed to Mandarin movies and Mandarin songs uh, before my parents had acquired Cantonese. 
So I want to emphasize that um, I'm not against Cantonese. Um, actually, it's the, the, the opposite. Huh? Actually, I embrace all languages. But right now, we are talking about Cantonese. And uh, Gina has made many wonderful points about Cantonese. And I think you know the problem that we are facing at Stanford right now uh, does have a lot to do with Cantonese being perceived as just a dialect. Okay, so I'm going to start my uh, presentation. Okay, so um, I am uh, I'm going to talk about the Cantonese program at Stanford and uh, the past, the present, and the future. And for the alumni here, you probably can recognize uh, Building Fifty. So um, the Cantonese, the Cantonese program started here, and then you know over the years has migrated to the Knights Building. And so let us now take a look at. Let me see, how come it's not responding to me, huh? Oop. Okay, so I'm going to show you the major milestones. Um, first of all, the program was started in 1997. So there were two, two unique sessions of beginning can conversational Cantonese um, that were offered. And then by 2004, uh, the program basically had grown uh, twice in size. So by then we had four two unit conversational uh, courses, but they were in three levels. So we have two uh, beginning level courses plus an intermediate course and then plus an advanced uh, course. And then um, in 2008, um, I decided to uh, switch one of the beginning sessions to beginning Cantonese for Mandarin speakers because we started attracting um, a lot of Mandarin speakers, and they do they do have needs that are specific to them. So um, I felt that it would be easier for me to address their needs and also their strengths, um, because they did bring you know they do bring in uh, knowledge of uh, the Chinese language into the classroom, and they can be helpful too. And then in 2015, I changed uh, the advanced Cantonese class to Cantonese through films because I was using a lot of movies, news clips, and documentaries. So if um, I'll take you to this website that three of my students have helped me put together. And so we have four series, the beginning Cantonese conversational series, and then the beginning Cantonese conversation for Mandarin speakers, and then the intermediate Cantonese conversation, and then the Cantonese through films. If you are interested, you can come and actually listen to my students' production. And let us go back. So um, if you're interested in what kind of materials I use, now these are the textbooks that I'm using. And of course I show a lot of movies. So if you're interested, you can email me and ask me about the pros and cons of using these materials. And on top of these, I actually have created a lot, a lot of my own materials. Basically all the materials for the events uh, class are uh, created by myself and also a considerable amount of material from the intermediate class and also supplement, um, you know, the two beginning uh, classes uh, because it's really difficult to find material that are suitable for uh, American students. And um, so the Cantonese program, I can say that right from the start, um, you know, the Cantonese program has, in, has involved a lot of activism. So in 1997, um, when Cantonese was first included in the Chinese curriculum, it was after years of student activism. And then in 2006, uh, a student had to file a request with Stanford. Um, he asked for a one five unit course, beginning course that included reading and writing. So he started with the language center and the response was no. So he moved up the ladder, you know, the chain of command until he finally reached uh, the provost. And the, the then provost, uh, the provost at that time actually approved his request. So Cantonese was offered for one year that included both reading and writing. Actually, Jamie was one of the students who took that class. And then in 2017, a student, uh, she was a junior at that time. So she had been um, asking the language center to allow her to use Cantonese 
um, to fulfill the Stanford foreign language requirement. So she had been doing that for three years. So by the time she reached her junior year, she was really fed up with that. So she wrote actually a very critical article, um, first of all, um, explaining the historical significance of Cantonese at Stanford, and then also pointed out um, you know, the challenges that she experienced uh, you know, in, ask, in trying to use Cantonese um, you know, to fulfill the foreign language requirement. She is fluent in Cantonese. Um, she is truly bilingual, and yet Stanford wouldn't let her do that. But after you know, she interviewed a number of people, wrote the article, finally, uh, the language center allowed, um, you know, allowed students to use Cantonese to fulfill the foreign language requirement. So the way it is now, if a student requests to use Cantonese, they will have to take three exams. They will have to schedule a Cantonese oral exam with me. And I am an official tester for the government and also for a large organization that specializes in foreign language testing. And then the student has to take a standard written test in stand, I mean standard Chinese written test. So I have been protesting about this. So why can't students write in uh, written Cantonese? Written Cantonese does exist. There is such a thing as, a, as written Cantonese. And on top of that, stu uh, the student will also have to take a, an online uh, standard Chinese grammar test. So, you know, even though students can use Cantonese to fulfill the foreign language requirement, there are these challenges. There's still these roadblocks ahead. So uh, if you're interested, I can tell you, you know, what are the reasons given, um, you know, I mean, what, you know, what language center uh, says about, you know, having to use standard Chinese. And then now, so um, now we have the Save Cantonese Stanford uh, movement. So I will let Jamie talk more about that, um, you know, uh, when it's her turn to talk. And um, so this is the logo uh, from that movement. And now I will uh, share with you, you know, the students. Let us see who they are. So the biggest group of students are the heritage speakers. And um, this is from one of the testimonials. And when you read the testimonials, this is quite typical of what you would expect from heritage speakers. They talk about Cantonese as being important because they learn a lot about the Cantonese culture. And also by taking Cantonese, um, you know, they uh, feel a lot more connected to their roots. So I just want to um, reiterate something <laughs> that is very, you know, very uh, apparent to, you know, most people which is language is an inseparable part of our culture. And now I'm going to play a little game with you. So lately, uh, it was just within the last few weeks, I was teaching my beginning students terminologies about rooms. So if you look at the first one, in Cantonese, also in English, uh, we call it a bedroom, a, a, a room where you sleep. So we call it a sleep room. The second room is actually um, is, um, a maze room. So it's a domestic workers room. Huh? So we call it a maze room. And then the third one is a kitchen. So in Cantonese, we call it a kitchen room. And here you see, uh, this is actually a clothes washer, not a dishwasher. So just this picture alone already tells you a lot about Hong Kong culture. Why is it that you don't see a dishwasher here? Instead, you see a clothes washer. So if they're interested, you know, I can explain. And then now this is a house and um, this is a garage. So in Cantonese, we call a garage a vehicle room. So we use a room for all four of these, um, these things that have been featured here. So now the game. So there are two ways to pronounce the word room. One is fong. This is in the original tone. The other one is fong. And according to a very famous linguist, the change tone, the fong, it's used for things that are familiar. So now let's play this game. Let's look at number one. Huh? This is called sleep room. So what do you think? Should I use a change tone or the original tone? So if you like, uh, you can type your answer in the chat box. 
And what about the domestic workers room? Now let us think about the kitchen. And then last of all, let's think about the garage, uh, the garage which is known as the vehicle room. And here are the answers. So for four, actually one, two, and three are all pronounced as four, pronounced with a change tone. So some of you may wonder, oh, why is a maze room, um, you know, actually a familiar thing in Cantonese, in Hong Kong Cantonese? And the answer is about 5% of the population in Hong Kong are actually domestic workers. Because of them, since 1970s, Hong Kong women have gained independence, meaning they actually are free to work outside of their families. And so at the uh, Gong Yan Fong, huh, actually is a familiar <laughs> item in Hong Kong. And then the last one, the garage, the car room, actually we use the original tone for a very simple reason. I actually don't know a single person in Hong Kong who owns a garage. <laughs> you may be lucky to have uh, a parking spot, uh, a parking space in your high rise, but you will have to be super, super rich in order to have a garage, or you will have to live in a very remote area where land is not as expensive. So this little game itself, um, you know, already shows you how much you can learn about the culture just through everyday language. And now uh, let us look at the second largest group of students. They are Mandarin speakers. So initially I would say about 90% of my students were heritage speakers, but now um, Mandarin speakers actually have grown in number and now they are about 40% of my students. To many of them, they grew up watching Hong Kong movies, singing Canton pop, so they actually are very interested in popular Cantonese culture. But after they start learning Cantonese, very often they will tell me, wow, I have learned so much more about Chinese culture by learning about Cantonese. So again, I'm going to show you a quick example. So, now, you so we, you've got one minute left before we Okay, sort of so I, I would just talk about this and I'll end, huh? So, um, so we just celebrate a Chinese New Year. And so you probably are aware that we like to eat seeds uh, during Chinese year, Chinese New Year. So why is it so? Ah, nah. because first of all, seeds symbolize spring and Chinese New Year, the Chinese New Year celebrates the beginning of spring. But then the kind of seed that you will eat depends on your region. So to the left, these are the wa watermelon seeds and they are consumed by Cantonese speakers. In the middle, these are Shanghai knees. Uh, these are uh, what it, the, uh, pumpkin seeds. So they are uh, you know, favorites of the Shanghai knees people. And then to the right, we have the sunflower seeds. So the point I'm trying to make is, while the Chinese culture has certain universal themes, for example, we all celebrate Chinese New Year, the Chinese New Year, and we all eat seeds. However, the expression of the seed depends on the region. So there is diversity in this, um, you know, under this universal theme. And also, I just want to very quickly have finished my presentation with this story. You know, one of my Mandarin speaking students actually shared this story with me. And she said, Zhang Lo, see, Wow, I didn't realize why we always, uh, you know, would buy tangerine trees uh, during Chinese New Year. Um, in my Chinese class, I, this, that was the first time I learned that actually tangerine, tangerines in Cantonese is gut, and it has the same pronunciation as the word for luck or fortune. And that's why we all celebrate with tangerine trees. Okay, so I will stop here and thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, John Losi. Uh, so I think um, just to make sure we're moving along, I'm going to jump right into uh, my slides, uh, where I'll be. Uh, we've got a poll question. While I pull up my slides, you can answer this poll question. All right. Have you ever taken a Cantonese class? Uh, for th some 40% grew up in a Cantonese speaking society. Uh, 
Some folks have taken it uh, as classes at a university, 25 people have for a professional reason. And then, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. I'm uh, classes in an elementary, middle or high school. That's impressive to me, um, at least for the US context, it would be very impressive. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and start talking with you about uh, the campaign uh, to save Cantonese at Stanford. So we've got some kind of historical background we re received from Dr. Tam, and then Joan Losey told us a bit about the program. Uh, but what, what, what are we doing and how did this all happen? What, how did things unfold? Um, I'm gonna walk us through a kind of timeline of events. So in November, of 2020, uh, that's when I found out and several other students and alumni also found out that the Cantonese program was going to end. Um, and the reason why it was going to end is because Joan Lucy is the only Cantonese instructor at Stanford. And so by virtue of not renewing her contract, the entire program was, was going to end. Um, and so we began organizing on a weekly basis and we knew that we wanted to draft a petition. And the petition itself, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the most salient reasons for saving Cantonese at Stanford. And the first one was about Stanford's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. So the provost has launched this ideal initiative that, uh, and they're starting, the university is investing in uh, promoting diversity, equity, inclusion at the university. But there wasn't this sort of deeper look at, well, what about existing programs that contribute to diversity, equity, inclusion and support the Chinese and Asian diaspora at Stanford? Are you really investing in those? So we were saying, we were, our, our critique was that if you're eliminating the Cantonese language program, you're not living up to those values. The second reason, um, the second rationale for saving Cantonese at Stanford was the history of Stanford itself. So if you think about the, like how did Leland Stanford get wealthy? Um, how, did, how was he even able to uh, endow and establish the university in 1885? He earned his wealth through the railroad empire that he owned. So, um, the, and who were the folks who were building the transcontinental railroad that made Leland Stanford so wealthy? These were Chinese railroad workers from Guangdong, Canton province. They were coming from the Pearl River Delta area and they came to the American West to build this railroad. Many of them died. It was, uh, these were like very dangerous working conditions. And not only that, not only were Cantonese people kind of part of the sort of founding um, of Stanford's initial wealth, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of initial endowment was $30 million, uh, which by, by today's standards is much, is much more than that in the billions. But uh, more than that, people, Cantonese people worked at Stanford. They laid bricks of the buildings at Stanford. They were chefs and cooks and servants and domestic workers for Leland and Jane Stanford. So Cantonese people were there for the beginning of Stanford's history. And then the third um, our argument is the same one that Dr. Tam kind of uh, mentioned that, you know, Chinese people are a diverse set of people. And the, the assumption that Mandarin is the only language spoken by Chinese people is just, is not wrong. It's not borne out by the numbers or the facts. Um, and in addition, Stanford has really thrived uh, with its research program because of Cantonese. So Cantonese has supported some really, really cutting edge research on transnational migration uh, and, and other kind of early migrant communities uh, that including the Chinese Railroad Workers Project. Um, and then finally, of course, on a more personal note, Stanford's language, Cantonese language program was changing people's lives since 1997. And, you know, Dr. Denick failed to mention this, uh, but it took three years of student protests and lobbying just to create those first two Cantonese classes. And then even to allow Cantonese to fulfill the language requirement for one year in 2006, that was my freshman year, um, that was also a student-led effort. So our petition had these three pitches. We want four Cantonese classes a quarter. That way you can cover at, like beginning for Mandarin and big speakers and beginning for, um, for others, then uh, intermediate and advanced. We want Cantonese to finally fulfill the language requirement. And we want a full-time instructor, not a temporary hourly wage, wage worker to be leading this program. So we launched the petition. Oh, sorry. Before we launched the petition, um, we actually did reach out to university administrators asking for a meeting to kind of get some additional transparency around how this decision was made. And the response that we got was that no language programs have been canceled. 
and courses will be offered in response to student demands. And this was a very vague promise. There was no kind of explicit promise that Cantonese would even be included for, um, for the next academic year. And our initial requests for meetings with some administrators were denied. Um, and we wrote back and let them know that it, it is our position that eliminating the lecturer, um, the lecturer role for the Cantonese program it effectively eliminates the Cantonese language program. So when the petition was launched, we quickly kind of reached a global uh, audience and we didn't really expect it to be um, as, uh, as well received as it was. Um, Today, we have over 3,900 signatures, we're reaching 4,000. Uh, many of these individuals have a connection to Stanford, but many also do not. Um, it's What's also been impressive is that the, just the sheer number of educators and researchers and also professionals working at API um, organizations who've co-signed our, um, our petition. And we had a couple of more uh, prominent uh, signatories. Alex Lee is a California State Assembly Assembly person, and then Celeste Ng, the New York Times bestselling author um, of Little Fires Everywhere. She also tweeted about our campaign and signed it. So we have some uh, really great leaders in the Asian American um, and API communities who've, who've, who are supporting our campaign. In addition, we have some people who are direct descendants of Cantonese railroad workers who have signed our petition and in, in one direct descendant of a Cantonese cook who worked in the early Stanford dorms of the, of the, in, the, in the early 1900s. So after our petition was launched, uh, the universities kind of changed course. It, originally zero courses were going to be offered by the university. And then because of the outpouring of support, of support including uh, by you folks in this room who signed the petition, shared it with folks, spread the word, the university was now making this more minimal offer. They were going to offer two classes, but it would still be taught by an hourly instructor. Uh, but in January, that was also the first time we had, a, we finally had a meeting with a university administrator. So progress was, was being made in response uh, because of the petition. From there, uh, we started to kind of get some media attention, um, both at the local and national le levels, but uh, also global media coverage um, around, around our campaign. And that has been very exciting um, to see that we're really spreading the word and trying to get people aware of what's happening at Stanford and why it's relevant to the global uh, community. Uh, so, you know, now you're probably wondering, well, what happens now? What's next, right? Uh, our plan, our, our movement is starting to shift gears. We're trying to figure out how do we, it's not just about a Cantonese program barely able to survive. What we want is for Cantonese to truly thrive at Stanford. And for a program to truly thrive, it needs appropriate investment. So uh, we're interested in pursuing this proposal that we're calling the Cantonese Studies Initiative. And this initiative is two, it like has two parts. The first is an endowed full-time benefits eligible lecture position uh, like to lead the Cantonese program. And, and this would allow the program to exist in perpetuity, basically. Uh, that is, it would no longer be subject to the sort of conditions of like COVID-19, future budget cuts, any other, we don't, we want to protect the Cantonese language program from any further disruptions. Uh, and we don't want students to have to lose out on this opportunity to gain proficiency in what for many folks are, are for, for many folks is a heritage language. The second piece is programming to support the study of Cantonese history, culture, and peoples at Stanford. We really want to kind of uh, amplify the work that's already happening at Stanford around the Cantonese diaspora and like and, and kind of invest in creating, a, like why not given Stanford's unique connection to Cantonese people, Cantonese communities, why not have Stanford be a thriving epicenter for research on Cantonese people, history, cultures, and languages. So I would say that the work we're trying to do has this global connection because we really do want to promote a more pluralistic understanding of Chinese um, diaspora. And we want to we want to we want to convey how important the language is to build ties in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Macau, Guangdong. And, and what we're also talking about is this broader problem of ethnic minority languages facing risk of erasure. Uh, we, like our, our campaign is not anti any language, we're pro every language. And we really want to preserve minority, minority languages and counter mount, like widespread monolingualism. We think that 
Cantonese really represents uh, a lot of like what we're doing right now represents a lot of the same challenges that other languages are facing around the world. And we have this, we are, our position is that the best future we can create is a one is one where everyone can speak uh, in a variety of languages, including their mother tongues. As for community impact, we have countless testimonials from people who've written in, and it's many of them very moving testimonials explaining how Cantonese changed their lives. But many of many students of um, John Losi's have also gone on to serve Cantonese communities as well. So, uh, you know, Mark Liu has wrote a testimonial talking about his over decades worth of, uh, of community work that he's done in Chinatown. Uh, serving these communities and providing them help with housing benefits and workers' rights issues. Uh, Laura Ng uh, and Han Tian Zhang have both done research where Cantonese has played a really important role in allowing them to do that. Uh, research on Cantonese migrants and also research on Hong Kong. And then Lena Yin, we have um, this great photo here. Uh, she is uh, a, a, in medical training. Um, and she has talked about how vital Cantonese has been for speaking with patients. And you're talking about the Greater Bay Area and um, monolingual Chinese speakers, you're talking about Cantonese speakers. So that's been the community impact. I also want to close with sharing a little bit about the personal impact that the Cantonese program has, has had in my life. Uh, you know, this bottom right photo is a photo from a field trip that the Cantonese language program went to went on to San Francisco Chinatown. And we learned a lot of really fascinating history. Uh, this was our, our sort of class outing. Um, and then in the top photo, that's me actually, after taking uh, two or three years of Cantonese with Joan Losi, I actually went to CUHK, Chinese University of Hong Kong and spent a summer there to further my language study. And that's my, that, those are my classmates when I was studying abroad at CUHK. And then this is the, the photo on, um, in, on the bottom is me with Joan Losi during a, a recent kind of reunion. And then the one on the left is very important to me. That's my, that's my popo, my grandmother. Uh, because of this language program, I've been able to really build my relationship with her that, and, and there's no way that would have been possible if it weren't for the classes that I took at Stanford. So some of you are probably wondering, okay, well, how can I help? How can I be part of this movement to save Cantonese? Uh, first, we invite you to check out our website, savecantonese.org. And from there, if you, if you, if you have skills uh, like brain powered networks, creative thinking that you want to give to this campaign, you can join our team. You can join Team Cantonese as a volunteer. We organize over Slack. We have weekly virtual meetings. And we really encourage you if, um, to follow us on social media and to share our content. Um, I think in order to make the Cantonese Studies Initiative a reality, we need to generate broader interest and we need to keep this alive. We have to keep the message alive. Uh, over the next few months. And that's really challenging for a campaign. How do you keep a ca campaign alive um, for the long run? Um, so if you're, if you're willing to engage with us on social media, media, that would be a huge help. Please spread the word about our campaign and what we're trying to accomplish and why it's relevant to the broader um, global Chinese diaspora. If you have existing connections, share our story with them. And if you have existing connections with Stanford, uh, please talk to your Stanford connections about our efforts, whether that's st like Stanford alumni, Stanford faculty, Stanford administrators or trustees, please talk to them about what we're doing and voice your support. Finally, if you have some creative skills in like producing media content, we would love to have um, a, a, like a, a few more volunteers who could really um, help us expand in that direction. So uh, please check out our, um, our website, we also have a one page flyer called, um, that's like at tiny, tinyurl.com slash save Cantonese flyer. It's a one page description of our plans with the Cantonese studies initiative. And please feel free to share that widely. So I think I'm gonna stop and then get to questions uh, since we only have a few more minutes. Um, we've got a lot of them. So let's go back a bit. Um, let's I see. love that first one. And I thought that others would have even perhaps as much, if not more thoughts on this, because I think it's a really important one. Um, so I've been answering some of them in like through chat, but I thought that was one that the, the first one, sorry, I just sort of jumped in, but. No, 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 go ahead. So the, the um, after, aside, one question is aside from Cantonese being taught at Stanford, how can we support Cantonese language learning in our communities? It's a great question. 
Yeah, I, I, I think about this a lot, actually, because I think, as Jamie said, really beautifully, um, sort of like language, um, and, and I don't even like the word language death, because it makes it sound like it's, it's passive, right, then, then that, in fact, when languages sort of um, become less important, it's because we do that, like we as communities create structures um, that lead to sort of like the active oppression and 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 silence surrounding. I mean, languages need support. They need infrastructure, um, and and what that looks like, I think, varies from community to community. Um, and uh, what I'd love to see is more discussions like this um, in local sort of Chinese schools and Chinese centers. Um, although this is something I know a lot less about. Um, this is something that um, like I. I sort of supporting language education in Hong Kong. I don't, I, I wish I had really concrete suggestions here, but I, I think that this is a, a, a big sort of question and problem that I'd, I'd love to hear others sort of jump in on. <laughs> May I share my slides? Yes, uh, in response to that question. Huh? Yeah, okay. So um, I want to say something, which is since the umbrella movement, I really, you know, can see that there has been a revitalization of Cantonese, um, both in Hong Kong and in um, you know, overseas, overseas communities. For example, Fremont Unified School District actually uh, now allows students to use Cantonese uh, to fulfill their foreign language requirement. They actually will you know, count um, them as a credit for taking um, you know, a foreign language. So I actually helped um, a Sunday school that offers uh, Cantonese instruction um, to meet the requirement by the school district. So there are a lot of things you can do. There really have been a lot more um, resources on the internet too. So if you, um, you know, want to email me, I can direct you to some of the resources. And also uh, I want to really highlight the uh, publication of the first uh, literary journal, journal in Cantonese. It really is a very powerful journal. Um, so, you know, so there just have been so much more going on. And Cantonese uh, courses, you know, are being offered for the first time at Berkeley. They used to be taught by students as detailed classes, but now they are actually, you know, part of the um, ch uh, Chinese curriculum. And also, you know, the community, huh? So I just want to share this very quickly with you. Um, my students are helping me build up this website and we call it the Cantonese community. So it's very easy to remember, just cantonese-community.github.io. Uh, and um, I want to put my materials on the website. Right now on the internet, you can find a lot of materials for vocabulary building, basic things or a lot of video clips, but there are no structures, there are no lessons, you know, being built around them. So I am going to put a lot of my own materials here. And on top of that, I'm also going to go through, you know, what's on the internet and provide them. So um, if you, you know, so hopefully this is, um, you know, this will help. Huh? Oh, sorry. Oops. Yes, I just, yes. Thank you. So this is one of the things. Yes. Great. Um, so I've got we've got a few more questions that that are in the Q and A. Uh, one of them was who decided to end Cantonese instruction at Stanford. So one thing that has uh, been a problem, I would say, throughout the campaign and still is a problem now, is the general lack of transparency around how the decision was made. Uh, we we reached out wanting more information about how the decision was made, whether the decision was based purely on enrollment numbers or not. Um, and we believe that even though enrollment was kind of used, low enrollment was kind of used as an argument, um, Cantonese enrollment actually like performs better than many other languages that are more institutionally supported. Um, and so we, we, we feel that I think there was some general ignorance on the decision, like, like the person probably just did not see the, the unique value of Cantonese at Stanford. And I can't point to any particular um, individual, I, you know, we, I wasn't in the room when these decisions were made, um, but we did ask for more transparency and we haven't really received as much as we think we yes. deserve. I actually, I can answer the question. Is the director of the language center 
So Stanford is very decentralized. So the provost is the budgetary officer. And then, you know, she tells the colleges and the departments, you know, how much, um, I mean, she allocates the funding. And then the uh, humanities and sciences uh, tell the programs under them, you know, how much they have to cut. But then it's up to each department and program to make, um, you know, their own decisions. So the decision to cut uh, comes from uh, the director of the language center. And that's probably why she has refused to meet with you guys. And mm -hmm. why, uh, why would she make a decision like this? Um, it is because of what uh, Gina, you know, has talked about. To her, it's just, you know, uh, disposable, huh? it's just a dialect. Mm. Yeah, I think one thing that's been also quite troubling about um, the decision making process from the Stanford side is that they, like the community was not involved or consulted um, around this decision. Joan Losey did not get to weigh in on how to save the program before a decision was announced. And students were not involved or vo their voice is not included. And, I, and even beyond that, Asian voices were not included. Chinese voices were not included in the decision-making process. The people who've been making these decisions who are in these administrative roles are all white. Um, and so the sort of lack of transparency and an un then the sort of general unwillingness to, um, to involve proactively the communities that would be affected by this decision. Um, I think that's what that's part of what made made it so hurtful. Uh, so I think another question was, uh, let's see. Um, let's see, I believe, sorry. Um, oh, okay. Someone has mentioned that, uh, you know, there aren't decent Cantonese programs for kids. Um, and that's also a big problem uh, for sort of helping to, to keep the language alive. Um, you know, I will even say that I grew up and I went to Chinese school every Saturday to learn Mandarin, despite the fact that not a single member of my family speaks Mandarin. And I think there's another comment in here about, you know, uh, how can we convince Hong Kong immigrants uh, to treat Cantonese as a language that's important to identity? And I, that, that's definitely a challenge that I've experienced, where I was sort of forced to, to learn Mandarin, even though my interest was to learn Cantonese. And honestly, if I wasn't at Stanford, I don't know that I would know Cantonese. Um, it was because I got to Stanford that I finally had an opportunity to learn the language I wanted to learn and speak with my relatives. Um, so I, I think that's a complex question around how do we convince people that Cantonese is a language worth learning? Um, if any, if either of you want to comment on that. Yeah, it's, it's something, <laughs> this is another one of those things where I feel, um, I feel sort of really frustrated and, and as a, as a historian, it's, um, it's, I think it's important that we, we take these questions seriously, but, but, um, one of the sort of problems of being a historian is that when it comes to sort of concrete policy, um, I, I, I often sort of fall flat on this. But to me, I think that events like this, that even just sort of raise the idea that it's it's possible to be, um, to have a particular identity that's really meaningful to people, right? Is meaningful to be Chinese, um, that can be diverse, that can be multivalent, and that there aren't hierarchies within these kinds of identities. Um, and, that, and that there are, um, societies that are successfully terrifically multilingual and don't necessarily, I think there's a fear sometimes that, that this can sort of like rip things apart. Right. Um, and that, um, but it's, it's, it's difficult, right. When there's when like the power dynamics are sort of against, I think, um, uh, against sort of like emphasizing this kind of diversity, there has to be a will for it. And, and I, education is part of that, but also challenging power dynamics is part of that too. I know that's really vague. I wish I had a better answer, but that's, that's sort of where I, my thinking is at this point. We, we have an important question in the Q and A that I want to get to, how can we donate to Cantonese at Stanford? And this, another anonymous attendee says, how does funding play into preserving the program? Even the millions the athletics program raised couldn't save the teams that were cut. Um, so this is a great question. So, um, you know, despite the fact that we're not involved in uh, any fundraising efforts, the Office of Development at Stanford is currently assessing donor interest in this area. We, can, we consider this to be a positive development um, that they're looking for ways to fund a Cantonese program. Um, and I think 
that's that's encouraging. We really wish that we were allowed to be more involved in that process. Um, again, there there are some kind of there are ways in which Stanford works that like kind of uh, by design keep out the voices of communities like ours, and that's something we wish was very different. Uh, but but we do think this is a this is good news, and um, and the fact that the Office of Development is taking some time and effort to look look into don assessing donor interest is a good good thing for, for us. Um, and I think it is absolutely essential that we identify um, or the Office of Development uh, identifies donors or major donors who are interested in endowing this program and supporting the Cantonese Studies Initiative if we want the program to continue. Um, so funding absolutely plays an essential role. Um, but as for how to donate to Cantonese at Stanford, we're, a, we're currently a volunteer run effort and, uh, and you know, donating uh, your skills, uh, your time, your expertise, your brain power would be fabulous. We don't, we currently don't have a, a fund um, that we use, but uh, please reach out to us. I'm sure we can find a way to use a, <laughs> to use a donation. Um, if, if that's something that you're willing to, to do. So thank you for asking that question. Um, we're over time and I just wanna make sure that we're respecting everyone's time. Uh, people who you know maybe have plans at nine o'clock, I'm happy to stick around and continue answering questions. Um, but you know, uh, Dr. Tam, if, if you need to, to leave or, or Kevin, um, oh, we're not over time. Does this I run until 9.30? 9.30, yeah. Oh my goodness, this is fabulous. I had no idea. Okay, great. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, um, and answer some more of these questions because they, they keep coming in. Um, okay, so with rapidly increasing levels of political pressure being placed on Hong Kong, is there any evidence of a campaign to subvert teaching of Cantonese in overseas communities? Uh, Stanford has a Confucius Institute. Does this leave the university vulnerable to such manipulation? Uh, so as far as the decision that went into, um, uh, you know, uh, the decision to end Joan Losey's contract, um, Joan Losey was not the only person uh, who was affected by COVID-19 budget cuts. Many languages were affected and Cantonese was actually not the only one. For example, Vietnamese and Tagalog were also aff affected and also some Northern European languages were affected by budget cuts. So, um, you know, to, to my knowledge, uh, there was, I think the decision was based out of ignorance um, and ignorance about the importance of Cantonese um, and in ignorance about how vital it was to the Stanford community. Um, and so I, I, I can't speak to um, any other sort of behind the scenes campaigns, but that is my general impression. I can, I, I can also, I can speak a little bit broadly here um, because I, I don't know, I don't know much about Stanford or even really much about overseas, but I do know a bit about hap what's happening in China. Um, and I think that that matters too, right? Um, and so, what what I see happening when it comes to to, to to Chinese languages in particular, right? Because China also has a lot of non-Chinese languages that are spoken throughout the country, um, is that there I haven't so there's not a lot of opportunities to learn these in schools, right? Like schools are very Mandarin focused. Um, there are there are spaces for sort of entertainment in local languages, Cantonese being one of them, um, but they're limited. Um, and they and they often sort of like like an example is that the the app Douyin, which is I think like TikTok. Sorry, I'm a little old when it comes to apps. Um, but that they started censoring um, in for like 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 um, videos in Cantonese. Um, largely because they didn't have the infrastructure to censor them. Like they, you have to you have to put everything through a sort of online censor and you need to have infrastructure of people who speak Cantonese who can say like, is this politically sensitive or not? But that infrastructural stuff matters. Even if their explanation isn't, we're not trying to censor this language in particular, that the infrastructure to be able to make it a part of public life, that stuff kind of matters. Um, so I don't know specifically of any evidence of trying to subvert the teaching of other Chinese languages or even sort of non-Chinese languages that are spoken within China, like Tibetan. Um, I don't know of that specifically, but I also know that the rhetoric of devaluing other languages as not being languages of, 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 of being less important and the huge push for Mandarin, because even if they don't have to say like we're devaluing Cantonese by, by pumping so much money and emphasis into Mandarin and calling it just Chinese, um, that, that 
that has an effect um, and that that matters and that we should, this is something we should be wary of even before or even if these, even if like sort of the specific subversion isn't happening. Um, so that's, I, I, I do think, I, I feel really sort of torn about things like Confucius Institutes um, because I, I, you know, I, I live in a city where there would be no money to teach any Chinese languages if it weren't for stuff like that. We don't have one at my university, but a, a neighboring one does and has a Confucius Institute. Um, and as Jamie said, I think we should be pro all languages and not anti Mandarin, right? Um, but money does matter, and and so I think that this sort of just the immense amounts of power um, to to shape what the infrastructure of language learning abroad um, is, is, is something it's, it's important. And I, I, and I think that that's something we should be aware of. Uh, we have a quick comment in, um, with related to the previous question, um, uh, from Dan Tam. Thank you for this comment. Um, most universities and nonprofits, you can donate through Stanford and specifically ask that funds be allocated to a particular program. For example, he, do, uh, Dan donates directly to GSE and for scholarships. And, and so if you are interested or you know someone who's interested in making a gift to Stanford that would go towards a Cantonese program, please reach out to Stanford's development office. Um, and you're, we're, we're happy to, um, to, to help you or, or other people figure out how to do that. Uh, but it's, it's important that Stanford hears it directly from the donor and not from us. So if, if you're interested in or, or know people who might be supportive of kind of uh, helping to fund a future Cantonese program, please communicate that desire to the Office of Development. It's so important that the Office of Development um, or the Stanford, um, Stanford hears it directly from potential donors and not from us, because what, that's, what that says is that there's broader interest and it's not just the sort of, it's not, it's not like a, a group of people are organizing a campaign, but there, there are people in the community who are interested in giving. So definitely uh, that's, that's a great response. Thank you, Dan, for, for chiming in with that. Uh, a couple more questions. Do any of the panelists know about the status of Cantonese or non-Mandarin language programs across higher education in North America? So maybe Joan Losi, you can comment on that. Okay, let me see. I will, I have prepared a slide. Huh? Let me see if I can um, share that with you. Yes, unfortunately, yes, I'll share the slide with you. Oh, wait. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, no, nah, so you can see this. Oh, so, basically, from uh, 2009 to 2016, you can see that the enrollment, uh, college enrollment um, in different languages have dropped uh, substantially. And even for Stanford's Language Center, um, you know, they have lost about 30% of the enrollment since the financial crisis. And on top of that, let's take a look at this slide too. Um, again, you know, since the financial crisis, notice how um, our enrollment in engineering um, has increased, has basically doubled <laughs> since 2008. And at one point it was even, you know, a little bit, it was 50% of the undergraduate enrollment. So we are fighting, um, you know, these trends. Um, so what should we do? So the question is, there is a lot to do. And I hope Stanford is sensitive about this. For example, UCLA just announced that they have established a new department. So they're going to put uh, different European languages together and they're going to focus on transcultural studies. So um, they are going to tie, for example, colonialism with the uh, European languages. So I think uh, that was actually part of the reason I proposed a uh, Cantonese studies initiator because I think we do need to tie ourselves to other issues that are relevant to our students. We, so it, we're not just teaching you know, a foreign language, we need to broaden the curriculum. We need to have this transcultural perspective. And also, you know, if, um, among the audience, you know, we have people who know how to do technology. We need more interactive technology in language learning so that learners can have uh, immediate feedback. 
uh, Jamie, how much more, how much, yeah, let, let me see, let me stop here. I think we have, let's see if we can get to a few more questions. Yeah, 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 let, um, let's, let's do that, yeah. Uh, so Fi Lang asks, um, hello, thank you to the panel. I'm wondering if someone could provide a quick working definition for heritage speaker. Ah, that's a very good question. Even experts don't agree on that definition. <laughs> um, so it can be very broad. It can be anyone you know whose uh, family doesn't speak English in the United States context. So um, to someone you know who has some knowledge of the language, to someone who is quite fluent in the language. So my definition is someone who comes from a household in which uh, a non-English language is spoken, and um, you know. There has been a lot more emphasis on studying uh, heritage language learners' language development. So what we have found is, even if you were just a passive listener when you were a little child growing up, that passive exposure will help you down the road. So among my heritage speakers, one thing that stands out is um, their pronunciation is usually uh, a lot better than someone who has never been exposed to the language before. Uh, they will also be able to recognize some of the very colloquial expressions used around you know, in their families. Yeah, so I hope that satisfies the person who asked the question. Thank you. Um, we also received a question from Elliot. Um, I would imagine that if there were some significant donors to Stanford, who would support the teaching of Cantonese, this program would gain a bigger hearing and support. I would suggest you create a GoFundMe page and really use social media to reach out to all former alum um, who are primarily Cantonese speakers or bilingual speakers who want to see Cantonese um, preserved at Stanford and bring it to the attention of the Chinese or Chinese American SFA area community. Um, yeah, so, so you know, actually, Jamie, may I answer the question? Sure. So that was what I thought of right away. Yes, so back in November, I already reached out to the, uh, to the Department of Development and they insisted that I did not reach out to any potential donors. They said, even if I managed to raise money, um, Stanford may not accept the money, especially if the money is from overseas. And on top of that, even if we want to set up an endowed fund, so an endowed fund starts at 100,000. So, you know, it's not a lot of money. So I said, you know, I can set up an endowed fund. You know, I can set up a fund, you know, try to raise money um, by small donors. And no, you cannot do that. So for an endowed fund, 50% of the fund had to come from a very small number of donors, like four or five. And um, on top of that, so the latest, uh, so I work, I've been working with the, the Department of Development and the latest news, so they agree on, like what Jamie said, so they finally agree on looking into potential donor interest. And I share a list of names that I thought they should look into with them. And then, but then they also said that it may take two years or longer to set up the uh, large endowment. So I said, what about in the meantime, let us set up an extendable fund under uh, East Asian languages and cultures. The language center, uh, itself doesn't have any uh, funds that you can donate into. But the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures has been extremely supportive and they have an existing fund. So it's very easy to set up a small fund underneath their existing fund. But you cannot believe the response that I got <laughs> from a senior associate dean. Absolutely I not, yes. He said, absolutely not, yes. I mean, many of you, or maybe some of you are aware of the campaign to save Stanford sports. They raised $40 million and Stanford won't accept it. So we're kind of trying to uh, be aware that even if we fundraise the money, Stanford can outright refuse to accept it. Um, if it's not, if the, if the funds are not received in a very particular way. Now, obviously that doesn't make sense to us, um, and if there's a community outpouring of support, why not embrace it? But I think we are, are learning a bit from the uh, from like what other campaigns have tried to do. Uh, and also, you know, we're receiving very direct advice 
uh, not to go out and do our own fundraising. Uh, I think our job is to kind of, at this point, our campaign is shifting towards taking public actions that create the conditions for donor interest. But we cannot, if, I think if we were to sort of outright solicit for donations, uh, Stanford can just not accept any of the funds. And that uh, obviously these decisions are made by people in positions of power with, without consultation. I think this is a, like a broader problem where there's sort of vo community voices are not being heard or included and sometimes community dollars are not even desired. Uh, but I think what we're trying to do is figure out how to secure a future for Cantonese at Stanford. And to some extent, we have to kind of allow Stanford to work the way that it works while also doing our, our part to create the conditions for all of those efforts to succeed. Yes, yeah, so may I add, but I do want to encourage, um, you know, any listeners out there to reach out to development and express your interest because then you are helping us put pressure on Stanford. But they have promised to take the temperature of potential donors, right? But if they're also hearing from the community, then they know that this is serious. So, yeah, so I think, you know, just like Jamie is putting, um, I mean, Jamie and other volunteers are also keeping up the uh, publicity campaign huh, by reaching out to, you know, journals and newspapers. Yeah, so I hope, you know, um, any volunteers, huh, if they can reach out to the development, that would be wonderful. And if, if you're very interested in learning more about the sort of like behind the scenes uh, work that we're doing on the campaign and the things that we're learning about how an elite institution like Stanford works, you are totally welcome to join Team Cantonese as a volunteer. We have conversations about this sort of stuff and we welcome you regardless of your Stanford connection to, to be part of this broader movement. Now, speaking of the uh, broader movement, um, would, would Stanford's Cantonese program consider organizing, collaborate, collaborating with other local or national universities? We also have a couple of other questions related to uh, at Cantonese language education broadly. Have you thought about trying to create an online class for non-Stanford students? Because I would sign up, that's from Kenneth Hong. Uh, and then other people who are asking, you know, is there a way to connect folks in this call who have children and, and kind of connect, create some Cantonese language connections. Um, and I think these are all really great, great questions. John Losi, if you want to answer. Yes, uh, please email me. I have helped multiple parents uh, connect with each other and also connect with communities uh, or, or schools or groups, you know, that are, that are interested in uh, helping their young children learn Cantonese. And also uh, that is actually my goal uh, first of all, I want to establish a Cantonese club at Stanford, uh, create language communities, not just for Cantonese, even say Toy San Hua. I mean, can, the way I'm talking about Cantonese, I'm talking about like Hong Kong Cantonese. Yeah, but also, you know, you know Shanghainese and so on. Also want to support other clubs. And, you know, I want to start with small and then I want to be able to form uh, the Cantonese Alliance of the San Francisco Bay Area. And then we can, you know, move even uh, to the whole North America, you know, so a step at a time. So if you are interested, please email me. I would love to hear from you. We also got another question, you know, about remote or distance learning. Uh, oh, 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 yes. Uh, that is at, thank you. Yes, thank you. I forgot. That is what I'm trying to do too with this website. So I will, yeah, we'll, I'll put the materials there and also start offering classes, can be in small groups, recruiting native speakers to help. So the internet has made it possible now. So some tutors may charge a small sum of money, but you'll be surprised at how little, because a lot of them are doing this because they want to preserve the language. Huh? So we'll sort these things out. If you're interested, please email me, we'll form a team, we'll start working on it, figuring how to you know, uh, make things work. Yeah. Uh, I think some there's still questions that are that are coming in. Um, how can we make Cantonese curriculum a language option in other institutions, as in the UCs and and CSUs? Um, and another Ray Fox asks uh, Ray asks uh, Do other schools in the states have similar situations? Um, so this there's a you know there there seems to be interest in how exactly you might go about creating Cantonese programs. You know we're trying to save one from being 
uh, eliminated. But uh, yeah, I, I, if, if anyone on the panel has thoughts about how to kind of support, um, I would say that my, my, my feedback is that uh, student lobbying and activism has to be part of it. Um, I think given the history of Stanford's Cantonese program, both it's sort of uh, or like it's activism around creating the program and then activism to save the program today has always been because the community has worked together to put pressure on institutions so that they will create a program like this. Um, but if folks have, um, if, if, if Dr. Denig or Dr. Tam, if you have any reactions to that. Yeah, also I think informing the community why Cantonese is important or for that matter, you know, other languages. So the volunteers are doing a wonderful job by going, um, you know, to, um, to the media. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, we ha maybe have time for one more question. Uh, Dylan asks, Leland Stanford obviously had a major role in the arrival of Cantonese, Sta oh, sorry. Um, in uh, Cantonese speakers to US via his railroad enterprise, but he also expressed overtly racist opinions of Chinese immigrants in his capacity as governor of California, calling them, quote, an inferior race and warning of their deleterious influence. How has the university failed to address or addressed Stanford's role in the rise of Sinophobic attitudes in America, especially given the current surge of anti-Asian sentiment in the US? It seems the university has a unique responsibility to support Cantonese speaking community in the present era. You know, it's funny because I think a lot of words have been said to support Chinese communities uh, where leadership will say, we support diversity and inclusion, we denounce all forms of hatred, but it's not really communicated in dollars. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, has the university tried to address the rise of Sinophobia? Um, they've done so in, in symbolic terms by, by kind of speaking. For example, the provost gave a speech uh, honoring Chinese railroad workers uh, last year, uh, saying, you know, that they saying like explicitly that Chinese railroad workers uh, from Guangdong province were essential to the creating of the, of the university. But uh, that was not that decision was not backed up by dollars. So uh, I, I, I think we're, we're kind of nearing the end of, um, of this panel. And to those of you whose answers I didn't get to, we didn't get to today, we're very sorry. Um, but maybe we can stick around a little bit past the panels if there's still interest. Uh, but still, we have you know, some last remarks from any of our panelists. Uh, Dr. Denig or Dr. Tam, do you have anything you'd like to say? And then after the three of us have our cl closing marks, um, uh, Emily Song from SAPAC has some closing mark remarks as well. Well, I just want to thank everyone for attending the event. It really means a lot to us. So, um, yeah, so um, I hope, you know, you can get involved and, you know, we'll make it happen. I'm very optimistic about the future of Cantonese. Yeah, I also just want to thank um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this um, for SAPAC and and thank you to General Oshi and everyone for and and for all of you for showing up. I mean, one of the things that that um, I I think we've that that grassroots activism and people caring about their communities um, really matters and and so it's really heartening to see all the people here who are really invested um, in 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 language protection and and creating the structures to to make sure to, for language survival. So, yeah. I think my closing remarks will be Kaya. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Um, Emily, did you want to uh, chime in? Hi, uh, my name is Emily Song. I'm the events committee chair on CPAC. Uh, we're so honored to be to create a space for everyone to discuss this. And I'm, I also took four years of Cantonese at Stanford with Zhang Lao Si. So I use Cantonese for my work every, every day and very grateful for the opportunity. And I hope future generations will have similar opportunities to, to do that at Stanford as well. Um, just want to say thank you. And for everyone who has not signed up to be a CPAC member yet, um, go to sapac.org, S-A-P-A-A-C.org. Um, as long as you've been at Stanford for, for three quarters, you uh, qualify to be an alumna or a, um, 
So go, go to our website. It's a free membership. So we have a ton of events like this. If you're interested in uh, Asian American culture and advocacy, uh, we have an amazing lineup of events coming up. So please sign up on safepack.org. And a huge shout out to all the work that uh, Jamie and John Osi have put together and your army of volunteers who have been helping with this initiative. Uh, a quick shout out to Kevin too, who uh, has been helping us run this event as well. Um, so thank you. If you, uh, we'll, we'll give your time back on a Saturday, but if you uh, would like to say a quick uh, hi and thank you to John Osi, she will uh, hang out for a few seconds to say hi to her students and former students uh, this will become a informal uh, space for everyone to chat. Thank you all. So that brings our event to a close. Um, I also found it personally moving how many people came here, were engaged in listening and asking questions. Uh, our campaign has made a pretty remarkable amount of progress in only a couple of months uh, of even existing, and it's only because of supporters like you. So thank you for doing your part to save Cantonese. Don't forget to use the hashtag, follow us on social media, savecantonese.org, uh, join us. So thank you again. Thank you.